Hello everyone, with so much information in the world, what do you know is true and how do you know how to believe it? Today's topic on the One Year Life Transformation Challenge. Hello everyone, what do you believe and what do you know and what's the difference? So many confusing messages come in our lives as children, we believe in Santa Claus, as we get older we know that not to be true and we really have the bedrock of what we know dismantled in front of us many many times during our life and it can leave people quite cynical. So today I want to talk about what you should believe, what you could believe and what serves you. So as always I'm going to begin with a quote on the subject and that quote is Every experience, no matter how bad it seems, holds within it a blessing of some kind. The goal is to find it and the lesson within, from the Buddha, probably. A lot of quotes are attributed to the Buddha and Jesus and great wise men and we, we, we don't know if that's the true source, but it sounds right. It sounds like something my homeboy the Buddha would say. Ultimately, anything we say comes from a collective unconscious. To own an idea is, is to be foolish. It exists without us and within us and it always comes from nothing to somewhere. So, you know, those sort of quotes are really powerful and it's not completely important who it came from. If it did come from the Buddha, so that's spot on. So. My personal experience with what to believe was I am a very trusting person. I've always been an incredibly trusting person. I was always a person who was of the belief system that I will trust you implicitly until you give me a reason not to believe you, which is I, I love. I find it a great way to go through life. However, it means I was easily manipulated. So I felt that the information being presented to me by my parents, teachers, and um, by the mass media was correct and true. Now. I've now learned for that to be the opposite, to know that that information is incorrect. Now, it was a, it's a death blow for a lot of people when they go through their awakening stages to realize they've been lied to for so long. It's such a, such a hurtful thing, especially be, to be lied to from so many close people in your life. But the important thing to, is to realize is they're not lying to you. They are doing the best they can with the information they had at the time, and that's it. And they pass it on to you, hoping that it could serve you in some way. So there's no giant conspiracy. There's no, you know, no one's out there to get you. We simply have we've got. We've got what we've got, and we must expand and leave our comfort zones to find the real truth. And the the voyage of this flesh suit that we wear is over our soul is to learn and to find the truth. It's a great journey. It's like why do you play a video game to find out what's at the end? That's what this is all about. And it's best illustrated in a story that I thought everyone knew, but the more people I tell the story, the more people will say, wow, I never heard that story. And the story is titled, The Emperor's New Clothes. And we'll set it in the medieval scene of, say, the 1300s, where a king of Burgundy was looking to have his, have his, um, his 50th anniversary. And this guy was known for his loud, audacious clothes. He was known for his fine jewellery. And basically, every time he had his yearly parade, he would roll out in the best most beautiful you know, coats with mink and diamonds and sapphires and everything sort of encrusted in a giant crown. However, this was his 50th, his 50th, 50th event, so he wanted to mark this, and he basically worn everything. So the call went out across Europe to find someone who could produce the, the finest, most amazing robe that he could wear on this, and, and money was to be no expense. So, this, this call went across all the kingdoms and finally, um, after many, many people attempted but um, didn't succeed, a man entered the courtroom and he had a long beard and you know had a long flowing gown and just had a very mystical aura about him, very charismatic and said to the king in very convincing terms, not only do I have the most beautiful gown you can ever wear, I have a magical gown that will make you look incredible for your 50th inauguration. The king said, well, that sounds fantastic. I've never had anything magical. So what I'll do is I'll sign this guy up. So he signed the guy up and the guy would you know, measure him and look at him and put him in the mirror and try and work out his dimensions and then would go back that night and goes, I'll spend all night working on this incredible robe that will blow everyone's minds and you'll be known as the most handsome, most beautifully dressed emperor of all time. So in the morning, the emperor's waiting and eagerly and the, the tailor says, get into you know, the change room and take your clothes off. And the tailor walks into the um, change room and puts a cloak, a big cloak, if using his hands, onto the king. Now, 
he was doing this figuratively, so it was like charades. He had nothing in his hands, but he put it over the king, and he moved the king out to the giant mirror that was in the hallway. And the king looked into the mirror and was very angry, and just before the king could speak, the tailor said, King, let me explain to you what I worked on last night. The cloak you're wearing is of the most beautiful, amazing material ever seen. It has condor feathers, the jewels of India, has the most incredible silks from all around the world, and it is the most stunning, beautiful thing any human has ever worn. However, it does have magical properties as well. And the only people who can see this cloak are smart people. He goes, it's so powerful and it's so overwhelming that dumb people just can't see it. They'll see you as naked, but smart people will see the cloak for what it is and see your majesty. And isn't that what it's all about? You know, you don't really care what the peasants think, do you? You want the, the royal kings of Europe to see you. And as the king sort of turned in the mirror, the tailor said to him, so you see it, don't you? And the king lied and said, yes, I can see this, this gown. It's, 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 it's amazing, it's beautiful, it's, it's fantastic. The tailor smiled, smiled to himself and realized he'd saved some money and got paid by the, um, by the king. And then the king walked into his courtiers who were getting ready for the coronation and said, look at my gown, it's absolutely incredible. Everyone's mouth dropped because the king was ostensibly naked. And it's when he said, and if you can't see it, it's because you're not smart. And the magical properties of the gown mean that only smart people can see it. So all the individuals in the courtroom sort of went, yes, it's incredible. That is an incredible, that gown is mind-blowing. King, you were going to blow everyone's mind. The king gets into his carriage and he trots off. And as he trots off through the villages, which are now crowded with people, the rumor spreads that the king has a magical coat that can only be seen by smart people. And as the king walked past, or cruised past in his carriage, naked people clap and cheer and go, this is the most wonderful outfit I've ever seen anyone wear. And eventually, a young blacksmith boy who was asleep and didn't know anything about the coronation because he'd been working his 14 hours days like slave labor for children was back in the day, he walked out, saw the carriage and said, why does the emperor have no clothes? And immediately, everyone stopped and realized how ridiculous this was. It was obvious that the king had no clothes and no matter what anyone said, he had no clothes. I love that story. The innocence of a child revealing the truth and also how often we blind ourselves because we don't really want to be seen as being dumb. So we don't question things. We allow things to happen because we don't want to look stupid. And the emperor has no clothes is such a fantastic um, concept. So what do you believe then? What do you believe if people are so good at creating riddles and stories to trick your um, monkey mind? Well, people will always have advice. Know that. If you ask someone for advice, even when they don't know the answer, they'll make it up. We have a very creative brain and people love to give advice. So even if they're not sure of the answer or even if it's not something they do themselves, they will give it. So that's not a great strategy ever. Either it's just getting um, advice. And one of the other challenges we have is that even through the storytelling tradition we have, which is a great way to learn about archetypes, whether it's the story of Didius from Homer's Odyssey or whether it's Shakespeare or whether it's the movies that you see like The Matrix, ultimately those stories do have messages. But the key is if they provide you with a moral at the end of the story, you are then unfortunately put into the box of what that moral means. You can't take your own concept from the story because you're told what it means. And it's like sort of reading a book and being told this book means that and thinking, well, I didn't think that when I read it, but now I do, since I've been told it. It's like when people find out that Bruce Willis was a ghost of the sixth sense, everyone's like, oh yeah, yeah, nah, now I think I know, but you've been manipulated, you've been told something, and you've backwards rationalized it. So, how do you know what to believe? You know, this is key, and what I want you to, as you go through this journey, is I don't want you to believe me. I want you only to accept your knowings. When I say something that resonates with you, it's a knowing. When I say something that doesn't resonate, and you don't feel it, don't believe it. I'm not here to be believed, I'm here to be a guide on a journey. So how do you know what to believe? I'm gonna provide you with five steps on how to know what to believe. The first step, look around you. This present moment and the manifestation of material around you is the truth. That is what the cosmos has created to serve you best, that's the truth. It's as simple as looking around you. If someone's telling you they love you, however, they've just hit you and you have a bruise, the bruise is the truth. The words, aren't the truth. The reality of the environment around you is the truth. If people are telling you that the world is a very safe place and you go out and get mugged, the reality is that the mugging is the reality of that moment and it's true in the moment. So the truth is only available in the moment. Number two, direct experience. Your soul's direct experience in this manifestation of reality is the truth. 
and it's your truth. It's very important to understand that your direct experience is your karmic journey towards truth. And what's true for one person can true, be true for another. And as the um, Sioux Indians used to say, never judge anyone till you've walked a mile on their moccasins. Your truth will be through your experience, so you never need to judge anyone else. Number three, say maybe. Say maybe to everything. People who know me know that my answer to pretty much everything is maybe. They'll say, Brad, your videos are amazing. You're going to be an incredible success. I'll say maybe. They'll say, oh, you know, I don't like your videos. They're going crazy. You know, you're a crazy person. I'll say maybe I am. Because ultimately, sticking to firm truths and deciding what's true and not true doesn't always serve you. It doesn't give you flexibility. Say maybe to everything until it feels right. Don't just accept things and nod things like yes man because you'll be held to that later. And don't disagree with people for no reason because it doesn't. they, they will just reinforce their belief system. It's better to say maybe, especially if it's something that's incendiary. If someone says something like, this group of people are all you know, idiots and terrorists, it's better to say, oh, perhaps. Then it's to say no and to fire this person up to defend his beliefs or say yes to become part of that, that negative cycle. The fourth way to know what's true is to be present. Truth can only be revealed in the present moment. The thoughts of your past are the last time you remembered that memory, so therefore they're going to be manipulated. In fact, in court, first-hand um, witnesses you know, quite often are just rejected out of hand because the human memory is so poor. What you think will happen in the future, once again, is a fallacy. The present moment reveals the truth, and the present moment's really cool, and it will change. So be careful to hold on to truth, because the next present moment, you can find some new truths. So just be flexible and move with it from the present moment. And number five, as the Buddha said, sometimes wisdom is choosing the great, greater happiness over another happiness. When you do choose your truths, choose the truths that serve you and serve others. Because ultimately, what you believe will become part of your worldview. So believing things like these people are out to get you or I can't lose weight or my job just sucks and never get better. Those beliefs don't serve you and ultimately they won't serve your life. So when you actually in your direct experience and you feel like you're in a good place, choose the beliefs that serve you because that will manifest from this present moment your attitude. And your attitude is your attitude and how high you want to fly depends on that. You believe what you know. What you know is what you've always known. What you believe is what you've been told. An example would be is I know we're all connected. I just feel it. I believe the world is round because I've been told the world is round. I've been shown photos. But I don't know that. I wasn't born going, I know the world is round. So that's the difference between a knowing and a belief. Follow your knowings and say maybe to your beliefs and you'll find a very flexible system of traveling through this world that we live in. I can't wait to see you tomorrow. Cannot wait. Until then, goodbye.